Well, I've worn these for 30 years or more. So, hey everybody, welcome to uh, the Leadership Book of the Month cl uh, Club, I was gonna say, discussion. I'm Kelly Burns and here with Brett Getzel. And Hi everybody. We are at four o'clock, so let's go, four o'clock our time in Kansas City. Um, on um, April 28th, 2022. And today we are going to talk about Dare to Lead, uh, the Brene Brown book, and we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Uh, Brett, you wanna do an introduction and share any any update? Sure, sure, thanks. Uh, Brett Getzel, I'm uh, really in the meat business. I do a lot of different things as it relates to uh, pork production, food production, mostly in the food service space, but uh, pretty broad background and, and came to know Kelly through uh, my time at Rockhurst as an MBA business school student, and she was a professor. Uh, for those of you who are maybe the first time on the call, this thing kind of morphed out of a, uh, an alumni speaking event that I had. And uh, the two things that really jumped out at everybody was the books that I was reading, which I had a huge assortment of books with me at the time. And then we also talked extensively about mentorship. And, you know, when you go into those speeches into those those alumni events you never really know what bullet points or what themes are going to resonate and you know i had my background my story my journey but we quickly really landed on this whole idea of books and people really continuing to invest in themselves um, outside of their mba coursework and then uh, this concept of mentorship so you know most of the folks in that mba class were early in their career or some potentially not even working yet. So the idea of mentorship was, uh, was something that really, really found a lot of traction. And then in the subsequent events where I went back and spoke at other classes, really spent a lot of time uh, on those two topics because they really seemed to have a lot of traction with the students. And you uh, didn't just share your idea about books or tell them that you read books. You brought in like a hundred books, carried them in and set them on the table and people were blown away and and looking at them and writing their own list and taking pictures and and that list is on the website. I'll post this link here for everyone. Um, well, the thing that was interesting, if you recall, there were students who wanted to buy the books from me. Yeah. <laughs> I said, no, 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 you can write down the title and certainly buy the books because I, I I don't know how everybody else is. I mean, obviously you can resell books, but I keep them. You can even see the camera behind my head. There's part of my bookshelf. I mean, obviously it's bigger than that, but uh, you know, it's been interesting doing these calls and these these conversations, how I refer back to other books. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, I've shown this before, but you can see I've got these little yellow tabs. So I can go back a year from now and there may be 10, 20 or 30 tabs in that book and pretty much highlight the key themes in that book that I really found value in. Yeah, it's so good. And I have um, behind me as well. And then every few months I've been going through to try to to get rid of some books. And then I love the little um, pop-up libraries a lot of neighborhoods have now. Uh -huh. So there, a lot of them are novels, but I put in some business books and, and uh, leadership books. And uh, by the time I walk by at the park, there's one at the park where I take our dog and uh, there, those books are often gone. So people oh, really? are, yeah, spreading the joy, spreading them around. And, well, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, so good. And we'll talk about a little bit more about that at the end of our conversation today. And uh, for anybody that doesn't know, I'm Kelly Burns and I lead Voyage Consulting Group. We're a consultancy that uh, works with companies on their culture and their leadership. So I do a lot of executive coaching and leadership development. And all of the books we tend to choose uh, for the leadership development journey. So the ones we picked at the beginning of, of our time is this, this is our sixth book, book conversation, our sixth book of the month. And uh, these have mostly been related to um, leadership of self. And um, the last one and this one, they're transitioning into leadership of others. And then um, we have some leadership of the organization that we'll uh, come up with as well. Um, any updates you wanna give, anything new? Well, I think relative to our group, uh, kind of an interesting deal. I have a, a friend up here who's a, a graduate student or not a, a, an MBA graduate rather, and uh, potentially going to go join our group, which I think is really exciting. You know, the first couple of book reviews that we did were just Kelly and I, and it's amazing how people are starting to, to find us. And then, hey, I want to be part of that. So, you know, nothing's really more inspiring than being having a group and then saying people want to be part of your group. Yeah. So we're very excited about that. Dave Lingerfeld, who has been with us, I think, on the last two uh, broadcasts, if we, let's call him that. And, and he was had a conflict tonight. But this uh, this other gentleman is, is we're vetting him out. If I make it sound so official. <laughs> 
but uh, you know, he's he's really kind of shares our passion for for reading and personal yeah, development. He and he's a little younger fellow than what I am, and so he's at a different stage in his professional journey, but just wants to get better and wants to continue to invest in himself. And you know, that's the some of the value that I found here is just having this obligation, which that kind of sounds negative, but having having this opportunity rather each month to get on the call and talk to you and uh, share this this journey with these books has really kept me grounded and kept me reading. And, and you know, I, I, I'll be honest, I'm human, right? If I didn't have this opportunity each month when I read a book each month, eh, there may be a few that I skip, but you know what? I, I, I look forward to this and it's really mm -hmm. been exciting to me to stay really in the books and stay active that way. Yeah, me too. And then I found I've, I'm reading even more outside of the ones we pick. And then I'm pretty, uh, for everybody should know, we are very selective about the ones that make the list for this live uh, live conversation. Um, as Brett said, the original intention and remains our intention is um, to inspire continued leadership development for leaders. And so we try to pick modern books that um, are relevant, that people are talking about, that uh, are um, that we find useful. And um, most of the time there've been books so far that we've read in our in recent years in our past and that we've really enjoyed. And this one was a little different where I'd, I'd read it a few years ago when it came out and then um, Brett read the reviews and did the research on it and he recommended choosing it. So um, we uh, chose it mainly because of it's focused on leadership behaviors needed for today's complex world. And this again is Brene Brown's Dare to Lead. Here we go. And um, let's see, she is a PhD and um, um, social work master's degree. Uh, she calls herself a, a researcher and storyteller. She's a professor at the University of Houston. And she spent 20 years studying courage, vulnerability, shame, and empathy. And she has had six New York Times bestsellers, and this including this one. And um, let's see, I thought I had a number here. Millions and millions of copies, but oh, 57, her TED Talk is the mo one of the most viewed TED Talks of all time, The Power of Vulnerability. And it has been viewed more than 57 million times. On the um, link here that's, um, voyagecg.com slash leadership books. There is a handout there. Um, okay, and so the handout will um, includes links to her website and there's a specific website for this book. Um, there's an the author website and her on LinkedIn and on Twitter as well. Um, so I was going to say I thought in there that I had the um, link to the TED talk, but but it's not in there. You'll you'll find it on her website though, or Google it and you'll find it. Um, and she also does two podcasts. Um, one is based on this book, Dare to Lead, and then the other is called Unlocking Us. So um, uh, it's been a fun pregame to get ready for this conversation. So we always talk that a few days before. And um, I had not recommended this book to people. And so when Brett brought it up as one to read, I was really excited to see what his take would be. And um, this was not your favorite book, fair to say? Yeah, I I, I have to confess, this one was tougher for me. Uh, and and I, I really, really enjoy reading. And this one was just a little more challenging. And, and so let me frame that up a little bit. You know, as I read, I'm always looking for those opportunities where I can apply a technique or a principle or a concept, you know, call it tactical deployment, whatever term you'd like to use. And I just found very little of that in this book. So it doesn't mean it's a bad book, but as I explained to Kelly, I said, you know, gosh, if we get on the call and we're really endorsing these books and telling folks to go invest their precious time and energy and resources, either in buying the book and then reading it. And this is one of those where, you know what, uh, I'm going to leave that to, to the, that decision to the discretion of the viewers. So uh, take that for what it's worth. But this of the six books we've read so far, uh, this one was a little more challenging. So as Kelly pointed out, you know, we're looking at the reviews and looking at really what the topics are. And maybe we'll read the cliff notes to try to determine, hey, is, is this the type of book that we want to get behind? And, and, and this one was very, very highly reviewed, you know, four and five stars pretty much across the board. Yeah, but thousands me, of them. Yeah. And but for me personally, it was a little bit tougher to digest. Yeah. Um, and my friend Vicki Cannon is here. Uh, Vicki S. Cannon is a um, an entrepreneur and a leader in the tech space in um, 
uh, social media and security of social accounts and that kind of thing. And uh, so hi, Vicki. And she just posted that she listened to it on Audible and she does recommend it all the time. And um, Vicki, I was in the collective this morning in another group that she and I are in. And um, a couple of them really liked the book. And um, when I posted about it on LinkedIn uh, the other day to invite people to come, several people said that they that was one of their favorites, that they love it. So please do chime in with your thoughts. We'd love to know why you love it. And that can, um, those comments will accompany our, um, the video whenever this is posted on, um, you know, after today, those comments will stay there. And um, we don't have the ability to write back to the comments right now, probably because the platform wants us to stay live and not typing. So, um, but I'll uh, respond to comments later, but please do feel free to chime in. And even if you're on, if you're here with us, let us know you're here. We can't see who's joining us or, or if, if anybody's joining us. So uh, let us know and uh, feel free to chime in. So we thought for our approach today though, we didn't want to skip the book altogether, um, that we would talk about a few of the key themes um, that were in there. And so I had two huge takeaways that I like from the book. Um, one is related to vulnerability. So, um, you know, she had written, um, let's see, one of her other books, Rising Strong. I have a, my four or five favorite books are right up here. Um, oh, what's her other book called? Daring Greatly. Um, and I think it's in Daring Greatly where she talks a lot about vulnerability. Well, people read that book and kind of went off on the off the deep end about vulnerability. And so in this book, she clarifies what she means. She also did that on um, on CBS News, and I'll share the link to that on um, in the comments later. But she um, she clarifies what she means by it and what her intention is. And so people took it to mean that um, just share anything that you want and just in the interest of vulnerability, here's everything going on in my life or you know, here's how I messed up everything. And um, I've had several meetings where people have said, oh, I didn't get to that, I'm just being vulnerable. Like, and they've used it, leaned on it as an excuse um, and not being very judicious in what they're saying or when or how or sharing what or how. So she clarified what she what her intention was there. And her intention about vulnerability is that you go toward um, uh, conflict or chaos or rumbling, she calls it. Um, you go toward that. You go toward the the difficult thing to try to try to um, repair a relationship, that kind of thing. So it's not oversharing all your personal business all the time. It's um, it's being selective about that kind of thing and judicious and, and then um, being vulnerable to put yourself out there and go toward others. I think that's kind of a good summary. But Brett, what, what's your take on vulnerability regardless of what she had to say about it and where well, you see it fit in? Yeah, I mean, great point. I, I think when you know, people define it the way you earlier defined it, you know, weakness or being overly transparent, you know, and I don't think that's really what her intention is at all. So, uh, you know, vulnerable just re really means being, I, in my terms, I, I, I took it as being sensitive. You know, when I, if I'm in a meeting and I'm the, I'm the alpha male or I'm the leader, you know, I, I can be vulnerable and, and, you know, being sensitive to what other players are doing in the room or in the meeting, but it doesn't necessarily have to mean, as, as you pointed out, being overly transparent or, or sharing things that probably don't need to be shared. Mm -hmm. And it is okay to not be perfect all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. And, she, and you make a mistake, you can be vulnerable and admit a mistake and yep. then move toward the resolution and the reparation of not doing it again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And the, um, do you see that there's a place for it? Do you think there's a place for it in leadership? Uh, leadership of teams and companies today? You know, I, I, I really think there is. And if you think of like the C-suite level folks, right? I mean, if I'm in front of the entire company, which, you know, can be a hundred, can be thousands, can be tens of thousands. Is that the right environment? You know, maybe not. But if I'm in my C-suite environment with my closest direct reports and, and you know, people that I've developed a one-to-one -one relationship with, you know, that's an environment where I probably have a, a need and a want and probably a, a, an obligation to be a little bit more transparent with that group. So mm -hmm. I think the idea of vulnerability, the way that she defines it has a place in business, but I think you have to be selective. And I think as you move further up the, the chain, right? I mean, you think of entry level, mid-level, maybe senior management and then C-suite, you know, th there's a different different place and a different time for that type of behavior than, uh, than when you're at the top or when you're at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And, and um, RTR I wrote about on LinkedIn a couple within the last few weeks, read the room. 
-hmm. So what's uh, what's going to help the conversation or help the the um, situation that you're in? And and do you need support? Uh, is are you sharing something because you need support or um, to um, to get attention, to um, to use it as an excuse. Obviously, that's hard to admit, but um, but being aware of that is useful. Um, Vicky's got a comment here. You know that vulnerability ties to emotional intelligence, and I believe that's true. That yeah. there's a lot of similarities there. I, yeah. I think as as and again, we're talking about being the leader or being in a leadership position. Oftentimes, if if the leader breaks the ice, if you want to think of that that way, then then there's others in the room that say, okay, you know what you know, those types of comments or that type of behavior is appropriate. That can be negative. That can be positive. We're going to get to a few comments here later on when we talk about culture. And that leader is often the one who determines the culture and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Yeah. And um, with emotional intelligence, too, it's honest emotion. Be genuine about your emotions. So I've even had um, been in like all hands meetings where the uh, the leader speaking weren't that excited about great delivering some great news like show the excitement, that's part of it too. Like let people know you're excited about the results and what's been happening. Um, and if you're disappointed um, in the market change or something else that has happened, it's okay to show that um, and be genuine with the truth of who you are and what your emotions are. Uh, it's just read the room about it, I think is, don't use that as an excuse and um, cause yourself to become the center of attention all the time because of those emotions. Absolutely. Um, Vicki brought up another one that we hadn't talked about, but she says um, what she really liked was when she when Brene Brown talks about what does done look like. So when you're delegating or I think even working on a team project and um, you don't just give the assignment or give the basics, they you ask or you clarify um, what does done look like? I, I liked that question, too. Thanks for that reminder, Vicki. Um, paint and painting it, not just just not just telling it, but um, really getting to, to the description of of what that looks like. And I can picture um, how that would uh, save um, redos or do-overs uh, later. So thanks for that comment, Vicki. And if you're with us, feel free to uh, chime in a comment and let us know what you thought about the book or what your favorite part was. Uh, let's go on to one of our other um, questions here. Um, what about... Um, when a leader created trust, she um, talked about that. Um, what resonates with you in building trust? Um, any thoughts related to that? I, trust has come up in so many of the books we've read. Yeah. And so when you you know lob that question out, you can't help but really think about that because if you've ever been in an organization that lacks trust, you've seen that kind of, I'm not going to say it was toxic, but somewhat dysfunctional. And then you get into another environment, maybe that's high trust, you know, and how that that environment uh, plays out. So when I read that, I, that I immediately thought of, of Liz Wiseman's book, you know, Impact Players, and she talked about being on strategy or not on strategy. Mm. So when, when we got into a little bit further, you know, we, we think of trust. And then I, I thought of a coworker, a friend, um, you know, potentially a church or, or if we expand it even to maybe a company or a brand or a product, you know, do I trust a brand the same way I trust a friend? And, you know, obviously we're talking about a leader. So it's really how do I trust a leader? So then I Googled um, this concept of trust and they came up with several of the same adjectives about trust. But when you get into an environment that's got trust, you know, you're thinking of that coworker that leader being on the same agenda that you are. In other words, I, when they ask you a question, hey, you, you can trust, air quotes, you know, why they're asking the question and that, hey, they're trying to deliver objective achievement. Yeah, you got the same conversation when you get into an environment where somebody, where you don't have trust and you start to be very guarded about what information you share, uh, you know, working on that person's work team. And, and all of that, again, plays to that whole dynamic trust. Yeah. Oh my gosh, so much good information in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you think of some brands that you trust? What are some brands that you trust? Well, and that, you know, that's, that's again, where I went from a friend. Yeah. Do I, do I trust a friend the same way I trust a brand? And, and you know, what do I expect from a brand that I trust, right? Because we do, right? Yeah. Reliability, predictability. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one about the, the term they used was self-orientation. And, and I had to really kind of focus on that one. So mm -hmm. whether or not, does the person have their own self-interest mm -hmm. at heart? 
when they ask a question or they're part of the team or they make a statement. So the comment was, I can trust that person because I know they're all in on the group objective or the company's mm -hmm. objective. Or, you know what, I can't trust that person or I shouldn't trust that person because they've got their own personal self-interest at heart. And again, that all ties back to that that big, broad concept of trust. Yeah. I made, made the comment here. I doubt there's probably another word in leadership that's been written about more than that word of trust. It's just so, so important. Yeah, and I love um, Stephen M. R. Covey's book, The Speed of Trust. That's it's up about here. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's about ten years old, but he has a new one about trust yes, that I just, yep, I just got the other day. I think it's Inspire Trust. Mm -hmm. um, so I was going to look through it and maybe pick that with us, talk to you about it, and maybe it literally just came out. So maybe yep. that's when we pick um, for an upcoming. Um, upcoming conversation. Absolutely. I'd welcome that. I really love yeah. Speed and Trust. I did too. I loved that one. Um, let's, so one, one way leaders create trust is the um, alignment between what they say and what they do. So people know what to expect. And so a lot of times people, you know, their co companies will have core values or leaders will espouse these core values and then something goes wrong and those core values go out the window. Nobody follows them. They don't mean a thing for real. Mm -hmm. And so um, um, when she, one concept that she liked that I really, uh, or that she talked about that I really liked was about rumbling. So um, rumbling, dealing with conflict, uh, clarifying when that, um, that's, not in con that's not in alignment, when it's incongruent. Um, so how, how do you rumble? What resonated with you about the rumble, about the conflict stuff? Um, well, you know, when I read the rumbling piece, naturally my mind kept going back to a meeting and, and the mm -hmm. way she frames it up, you know, rumbling can simply just be a conversation. It doesn't necessarily have to be a meeting with multiple stakeholders. So, yeah. you know, the first thing is defining, you know, what's a rumble, right? And again, again it's just, it's really just two or more people coming together and, and talking about a topic. And then as, as she kind of went down that road, I think, you know, she advocated for having that difficult conversation. Mm -hmm. And in this PC environment, and you and I even talked about this in the pregame, there are so many meetings where the 800 pound gorilla just doesn't get called out. Right. And, and, and the meeting is a kumbaya type meeting and all things are good. And then there's all these sidebars and all these side meetings and, and, and the real the real work or the meat of the meeting, if you want to think of it that way, happens outside of the meeting or we yeah. have meetings to have meetings. And I think really what she's advocating is, hey, you know what, we've got all the stakeholders around the table. Let's let's get it out. You know, and, and I'm not saying air and dirty laundry, but let's have the tough conversation mm -hmm. and we can have the tough conversation without it being demeaning, without it being um, a, a, a criticizing. But let's talk about the tough things. Right. I mean, that's that's the nature of being leader. A leader is being able to make those tough decisions, mm -hmm. talk about the tough topics. Let's, you know, let's talk about the pros and the cons, the good and the bad, whatever it takes, make a decision and then let's live with it and move on. And, you know, we talk about it. One of the, the fellows I worked with, his favorite comment was, you know, if, if we're on target, we applaud or high five. And if we're not, we course correct and keep moving forward. Yeah. And I think that's that's a great way to look at it. But in this whole concept of rumbling, it's, hey, you know what, let's be prepared to have those tough conversations and uh, they don't always have to be negative. And right. part of that, you know, I think we're eventually going to get the culture and, and the rumble really speaks to what is the culture. Right, right. I love what you just said about your friend and that um, if your things are going well, high five. But if things aren't going well, how about a high five then too? Because that indicates we figured it out. <clears throat> we recognize things aren't going well and we're not going to let it and we're not going to cover it up. Right. And so many times I've, I've worked with organizations that let things go on way too long because they were too afraid to have that rumble. And, um, you know, people seem to have a feeling of I either say nothing or I have to be a total jerk about what I say. And there's so much space in there. And um, remember speaking up, being honest, obviously respectful and all that, but <clears throat> excuse me, with um, being a leader that's able to hear it and to take it as well. And uh, so you're you're not the one that gets defensive about it. Vicki chimed in. Um, rumbling. She talks about staying curious, stay curious about it and be about what others are thinking and going through and what their thoughts are. And then generous. I love that word. Generous with what you think about other people. So you don't get mad at them for bringing up the 800 pound elephant. <laughs> Let's see. And Vicki says, it reminds me of Nabo 
where we ask questions. Yes, yeah, so we have a, a National Association of Women Business Owners chapter is really active in Kansas City. Um, and we have a hot seat. And I actually was in the hot seat in, in April. And um, you, you share your business challenge. And then everyone, you go around the room and people get to ask a question. And they can ask anything that they want. You're not defensive. You just answer it. Um, and then, um, yeah, so, but you don't bring up solutions until you go through all the questions. And then the next round is more solutions toward it. Thank you, Vicki, for that reminder. Yeah, that's a great example. And and um, I'm I'm not gonna lie, I was a little nervous about being in the hot seat and and um, worried about what people would say and ask and and um, was I prepared enough to honor their time? And um, so there was a little bit of that anxiety. But you know what? You do it anyway and and um, receive the gift of the information that people share. So it's so much better in any kind of organization if people will speak up rather than um, um, just hold it to themselves or have all the silos and side conversations and all of that, like you mentioned. Well, yeah. and it's the idea of, you know, multiple minds are always better than one. So that, and that's so true. Yeah. Let's do, um, thank you, Kim. Hey, Kim Stanley. She says, great dialogue. Excellent. Thank you so much. I know we could talk about all of this for hours and hours and we try to keep our conversation around 30 minutes or so, 30 or 45. Um, so want to talk about core values next for a minute? Well, let's go to Arm of Leadership. I'm excited about that one. I spent quite okay. a bit of time on it. Yeah. Okay. So the, the book, I think she's got 16 or 17. I don't remember exactly what it was, but Kelly asked, you know, hey, pick out one of the armored leadership uh, or principles that you want to talk about. And mine that I focused on was hustling for your worth. And, and as I did this, you know, we're talking a lot about vulnerability. So I have to kind of be vulnerable here in that, you know, I, I have to say, what are my, what are my flaws? And one of them are, are hustling for worth. So as I, Define that. I said, hey, you know, everybody on the call, I think, has come to know that I'm in the meat business, and that involves packing houses and harvesting animals and warehousing and and distribution, and that's a tough racket. And mm -hmm. I, I've been doing that for this is the 31st year in that business. And oh, wow. years ago, when I started, I mean, it was almost a badge of courage to to know that you worked the six you know six days a week and the night shift, and you know you worked on Christmas Eve and you worked yeah. on New Year's Eve and sometimes even into Christmas Day and New Year's Day, and you worked as you know as hard as your dad did because your dad had probably worked in the same plant that you had, and, and I think that's starting to change. And I even made the comment this hustling for worth as armored leadership, you know, this next generation I'm you know in my mid fifties I think is looking at that a little differently. And we talk about valuing life balance and valuing time and family. And I don't think that they quite look at it that way anymore. And that's not wrong. That's not right. It's just the times that we live in and it's different. And, and so I, what I wanted to do would kind of put a bow on this is to say, as I led my team, I, one of the things that we used to talk about a lot was people would compare flight miles and hotel nights. Mm. And, and that was kind of your, your badge of courage, right? Yeah. I had 220 hotel nights and you had 180. So I must have more value and worth than you did. And, and I always had to bring the team back to center and say, you know, we don't have a KPI that has anything to do with hotel nights. And we don't have a KPI that has anything to do with flight miles. You know, our KPIs are sales value and volume and margin. And, and it was, it's always interesting under this hustling for worth deal mm -hmm. say, hey, if I'm busy, I've got to be valuable. Or if I'm busy, you know, I've got to be, you know, doing the right things and I'm on, on point and I'm delivering objectives. And, and again, I'm being vulnerable as we talk about, yeah. that ain't true. I can, I can be a lot less busy and a lot more productive and maybe redirect some of my time and my energy and focus to family, friends, church, you know, uh, group activities or other areas outside of just simply being devoted to work. You know, it's wow. that idea of all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Yeah. Wow. That's so good. That stings to me a little bit too. I, I'm guilty of that as well. A, a little piece of me, I was guilty of, of all of these in some way, you know, so I, I it kind of stung a little that, um, yes, there's 16 examples of armored leadership. And uh, yeah, so the one that, that uh, I guess uh, stung the worst was um, numbing. I think it was, it's number three and uh, numbing agents. So um food, work, social media, um, shopping isn't one, television, so numbing. So uh, um, rather than think about the big challenge, then I can, um, I have a game on my phone that my niece told me about when she was a kid and she's 20 and doesn't play it anymore. And I still play it and, you know, 40 minutes can go by and it's just numbs me uh, for, I don't really do it during the day, but at the end of the day, 
Um, and uh, she talks about not, um, you can't selectively numb. So if I'm numbing watching TV at the end of the day or um, playing this game or looking at scrolling through social media, that's uh, numbing everything, not just the one thing I'm trying to avoid or whatever. So Absolutely. yeah, that, that hit home too. And uh, I sure could relate to the one about travel. I had a job years ago with the um, American Management Association traveling five cities a week but not every week of the year. So it was about 32 to 35 weeks of the year, but it was like status if the flight attendants knew you. Like I knew their names, I knew the names of some of their kids, like the, yeah, that's a little much. So yeah, not good. I don't have that anymore. Um, so how does all that, how does any of that tie to core values? <laughs> you must've read my mind. We have a little ESP thing going on here. This is amazing. So during my business school coursework in my capstone class, there was a, a, a project or an assignment on core values. And, you know, obviously you had to define your core values, you know, mm -hmm. do some reflection as far as what you were. That was in my class, wasn't it? Well, we had one similar actually in the capstone. Oh, okay. So, but, and, and I hadn't had this when I had your class. So that's okay. kind of interesting. So at the time when I was in the class, I was in a, I called it a career change opportunity. I was, I was looking at other, other opportunities and, and I was so stressed. I had so much anxiety for a lot of different reasons about this decision. And, and I'm contemplating this, I'm going through this process. And then sure enough, I have this assignment and I distinctly remember the professor saying, you know, when you're in a situation or you're in an environment that is consistent with your core values, you won't be stressed. You'll be at peace. But when you're in an environment or a situation, you know, whatever the case may be, that you have a high level of stress, a high level of anxiety. I'm not saying it's, that some level of stress isn't warranted or isn't healthy, but an extraordinary amount of stress and anxiety. What you're in is you're in a situation that's inconsistent with your core values. And, and it may be something where, you know, what you're being asked to take on a job or an assignment or a project or anything that just is beyond your capability. Now, not to say that you shouldn't stretch or reach, don't misconstrue this, mm -hmm. but, but you're just, in, you're into something, you know what, that is just outside of who you are, you know, maybe, and I, I, I don't want to go into too many personal details, but the bottom line is I was overly stressed and, and thanks to that assignment, I was able to reflect and say, you know what, this isn't a good fit for me. This isn't a good opportunity for me because this doesn't reflect who I am and mm -hmm. I'm not able to, to, to be in a situation mm -hmm. or an environment or be a, a false leader that, per, per, you know, really projects one persona, but internally is really acting and feeling an entirely different way. So that core values thing was really interesting. I will tell you the list of core values in Dare to Lead is probably the most extensive list I've ever seen. I've yeah. seen a lot of different lists on, on values, but never one quite as lengthy as the one that she had there. But I did pick out, you know, a couple that I think that are common. And I, I even had a notion as I was prepping, if I really, really was genuine, I would go back to that assignment that I turned in and see what oh, core yeah. values I listed. I didn't do that, but I had that thought. But you know, I, I know you probably have your SCM around here. I could look that up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I noted uh, family, faith, career, confidence, <clears throat> courage. You know, and, and like I said, I there were so many of them that were consistent, and then some, you know, not so much. But uh, you know, family, faith, and career; those are kind of the cornerstones mm -hmm. of really who I am and what I'm about. And for people that know me, I'm sure they would say the same. Yeah, nice. I did the core values exercise in the, <clears throat> excuse me, so sorry, in the um, one of the other books that we did, The One Thing. So in that book, um, I did the um, weekend retreat that they had at the in the fall last year, whenever we talked about that. Yep. But the, um, and mine were um, um, something like speaking up, love, and innovation. So all three of those were the ones that came out. And, uh, but they categorize like faith and family and that those are part of you and your decision making. So they were looking more at characteristics, I think. But anyway, those were. Do you, so do you see where um, core values uh, play an important role in an organization and uh, the organization knowing them, <clears throat> knowing what their core values are and making decisions in alignment with those? Well, I, I think to your point, and you, you know, I think you do some of this in your your consulting. It's one thing to have them on the wall, 
but it's another thing to, you know, walk the talk, so to speak. I mean, it's it's easy to throw a, a mission statement or a motto or any of those things up on a sign or put them on keychains or whatever the case may be, blast from all over the building. And But if, if the company culture and the company's actions don't support and resonate with that, you know, it, it becomes, becomes an exercise in futility. And I, I've seen I've seen both sides of that. You know, uh, I, I was with a company several years ago and they had a tagline. And I mean, they literally lived that tagline. I mean, it, it was it was, you know, I, and I'm thinking of, of KU University. Right. If you say rock chalk to somebody, they say Jayhawk back. I mean, yeah. it, it's who they are. It's ingrained in your psyche. And this particular company, you know, out of respect, I won't name them, but they live their motto. And I mean that in a good way. Uh, I mean, they were all about their ownership and all about why they were there and what their purpose was. And, and there was no question about it. So, uh, and I know some people have been in companies where they say, oh, we had one of those things or we had one of those exercises. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we put the sign on the wall and we kind of walked away from it. And I would tell you with 100% sincerity, that's not the case in every company. And right. if you get into those companies, those environments where they truly walk the talk, you know, it, it's 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 really interesting because it and it's one of those things that binds people together a lot like the, the Rock Chalk Jayhawk thing. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it really brings focus to what you're doing. It gives purpose. It gives direction. And those things when everybody's moving, at, you know, you, you use the boat analogy, right? When we're all rowing in the same direction, it, it makes the job much, much mm -hmm. easier for everybody that's on the boat. And if there's um, rough seas, you're rowing in the same direction, but there's rough waters. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're unified with Rock Chalk Jayhawk or whatever it is, you're unified, then you can overcome those challenges and you can overcome the adversity. And uh, and that's such a great point. And uh, that's where a lot of companies don't, don't turn to their foundation um, during crisis or challenges. And the great resignation that we're in the midst of is, is demonstrating that people are seeing through all that BS that, you know, the boondoggle days about 20 years ago, the leaders, the C-suite would go off for a week to a resort and come back with a mission statement, vision statement of five or six core values. And, you know, four or five golf, um, you know, played, played golf four or five days. The, um, the boondoggle of that is over and um, and people don't like that disconnect or incongruency. And, and additionally, customers don't like it either. So when a customer goes on a website and sees, wait a minute, you talk all about service. Well, your service sucks. You know, when something goes wrong, you have the rudest people on your line or, you know, and can't even get a hold of anyone or, you know, so the um, alignment is key. And th that is the work that I do with companies and uh, the culture um, the culture evolution is our process, and that is the work that we do. Um, well, the thing I thought yeah. of, you know, and, and I always tr there's a lot of sports analogies in business, as you know, but there's this, the dream team, right? And it was the Olympic uh, team of basketball, and everything mm -hmm. they just you know, they, they obliterated everybody. Mm -hmm. And as you go through your career, you will eventually be on one of those teams. If you don't, you know, you've really had an unfortunate career, but you know, mm -hmm. been in the business for 30 years, and there were those isolated instances where everything was just perfect. I mean, you couldn't miss and everybody was on point. You know, everybody was pulling hard, delivering, and yeah. it was just, you know, life was as good as it could be. And and now having, you know, all these years in the business, it never lasts. And you say, well, you know, if it was so easy, everybody was doing. Right. And again, you, you know, we use this whole rock chalk thing. I mean, they, Bill Self has won, you know, two national championships in 19 years at Kansas. And you say, well, you know, everybody can do it. There's a formula and it's just not that easy. And, yeah. and I guess the point I want to make, if there is a point here, is to say when you're in those environments, when you're on those teams, enjoy them because they don't last forever. And, and you know, you just got to really take a, a deep breath and just say, you know what, it's a really special time. And, and, and obviously learn from it because there may be a point where you're a leader and you're tasked mm -hmm. with, you know what, developing the team, developing the culture and trying to create that little bit of magic that sometimes we get. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I love that. And create the magic and contribute to the magic, whatever level you're at or in Absolutely. stage of career. Yeah. Um, contribute as the teammate. Yeah. Well, sure part of it, too, it. is, you know, people get promoted. People move to different markets. You know, they have an opportunity to go maybe leave the company or advance with it. And, and that one or two key players are often the glue that keeps that team together. Yeah. And, you know, as, as a leader, I always said, you know what? Uh, there's there's no greater satisfaction than seeing the people that, that I mentor, I work with advance or get promoted and take on greater levels of responsibility. You, you know, you want everybody to be able to provide the best possible lifestyle to their family. And often that means, you know, moving on. It's unfortunate. That's yeah. those are the facts. 
But uh, again, there's that 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 moment of, of gratitude and satisfaction as a leader and saying, you know what, I played a role in that person's development. Yeah. And now look what they are today. And appreciate that team and the magic, like you called it. Absolutely. Appreciate it when you're in it. A lot of times that magic is formed during a crisis or during a challenge. Uh, you know, company people, teams come together closer. Uh, the Olympics was was an example of that. They, those competitors from different teams came together, uh, unified to um, to accomplish the, what their goal was and did it beyond beyond measure. Okay, now what's in my head is um, the uh, was it the 1984 Olympics with the hockey? So the the miracle miracle right. on ice. Yeah, that was a good one too. So we're we're at our time. Is there anything else from the list that you want to talk about or anything else? Vicky chi chimed in. Rock Chalk Jayhawk. Oh, <laughs> I was gonna say when you talked about Ku. You know, Rockhurst has a great tagline too, and Rockhurst is where leaders learn. So we, I, I talk about in, our, in my classes all the time that um, I already, I assume you're already leaders when you come to your MBA or I work with the EMBA, the executive MBA students as well. And I assume you're leaders already and that's why you're at Rockhurst and, uh, and treat, and I treat people accordingly. And uh, I think that's a good tagline too for, for, the, for that university as well. I think it's an awesome tagline. Yeah. I mean, and it just, it personifies what the university is about. It personifies the culture. I mean, yeah, there, it definitely does. There's no question about it. Yeah. Well, our next conversation is four weeks, um, May 26th um, at four o'clock, same time as, to, as today's recording. And our book is um, Conscious Capitalism, which is the book that our class is using for um, the course that I'm teaching right now is um, Corporate Social Responsibility. It's Conscious Capitalism by John Mackey and Raj Sisoda. And um, we will uh, pick up from pick up this book for next month. And um, this book actually has a section, I don't know if you've read it yet, but it talks in there about continued leadership development or continued development and continuing to read and uh, uh, self-development is a choice. So it supports our mission in our, uh, in our endeavor here that we have going on, Brett. We'll call out who John Mackey is. I think that's what's going to get yeah. interested. Yeah. John Mackey is the founder, uh, CEO of Whole Foods. And um, when they were, he was on board when they were purchased by Amazon five years ago. And um, so he, and he has another book after this. They took out one section from this and made it its own book, Conscious Leadership. But we decided to do the whole concept uh, for our conversations. And then Raj Sasoda is a uh, professor, and this book's from Harvard Business Review Press. Um, the subtitle, Conscious Capitalism, and the subtitle is Liberating the, Her the Her Heroic Spirit of Business. Well, and for means? those of you who've been on the calls before, mm -hmm. we try to focus on authors and books where people have actually lived it, they've done it. Um, you know, so many of the people that we've talked about, you know, they've, they've been in Fortune 500 companies, they've been in those pressure situations and had to, you know, be true leaders. And, and granted, some of our books have been about, uh, you know, consultants and lecturers and, and academics and things, but I'm excited about this book. I really am. Yeah, it's good. One of my favorites. So, and my uh, students that are in the class, oh, their class will be done by the end of May, but I hope they will join because they'll know the book of them backwards <laughs> and forwards by then. <laughs> well, and we should have Dave and Adam with us here next month as well. So yeah, that'll be great. I did add some more voices and 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 more perspectives on on our content. And obviously, each one of them is bringing uh, a wealth of experience in large companies, and and all of them have graduate degrees as well. So yeah. it's just going to add more depth and content, and more perspective to our conversation, and more diversity because he's a KU guy, and the rest of us are rockers people. <laughs> So. Let me take it. <laughs> well, thank you, Brett. Thanks for the conversation today. And uh, I always learn something and and um, appreciate you sharing. And thank you to everyone who joined. Vicki loved all the comments. And uh, thank you for joining us and being live with us and Kim and anybody else that watched. And the recording will be up. So I hope you'll um, enjoy the recording. So yeah. thank you, everyone. Keep reading. Keep reading. That's our goal. See you next time. <laughs>